Hey, John, thanks for joining us. Hey, man, thanks so much for having me, Yo. I'm excited to have you on the show, John. How are you feeling today? And I'm feeling good, feeling, you know, feeling stable, feeling stable, <laughs> not real high, not real low. I like living in this kind of four to six range. That's All right. Asking. All right. Are you in the four or the six? Uh, I would say six. All right. Good. All right. We're rocking and rolling. All right. So folks, today we have John Mabry joining us on the Share Podcast. And uh, John is a recognized actor, stuntman, spokesperson. He is also an international motivational speaker. Uh, impassioned philanthropist and avid athlete. Within the first three months of his uh, move to Hollywood, Clint's work attracted, wait a minute, Clint. Yeah, that's my middle name. That was my stage name. So don't uh, get thrown off. John Clint got, Mabry. Uh, right, 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 right. Okay, got it. Totally fine. Uh, right, okay. Well, I'm going to edit this anyway. All right. John's work attracted national media attention from People Magazine, USA Today, and Access Hollywood. Clint's acting, okay. John's acting career skyrocketed after being discovered by 10-time Emmy Award-winning writer-producer Stephen Bochco of NYPD Blue and LA Law. Is it LA Law fame or LA Law? LA Law, yeah. Okay. Back in the, back in the old days. Right, right, right. I remember that show. Love that show. All right. Since working with Bochco, John has gone to be featured in numerous television projects, including Cold Case, ER, JAG, and such featured films as Super Bad and Sublime. Sound about right, John? Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah. All right. And this is where this is where I'm the most excited about. Like when I saw your bio, it was Super Bad. <laughs> <laughs> Of all the things, right? <laughs> exactly. So, so, so I told my wife about you. I said, well, I'm doing this interview. He's, he's a huge fan of Superbad. She goes, oh, that tells me a lot right there. It tells me right. a lot about A right there. <laughs> I'm like, no, man, this guy's charismatic, great, great personality. Everybody loves him. He loves Superbad. And she was like, ew. <laughs> my, wife won't, my wife won't even watch Superbad, you know? Well, Dude, I, I walked out. We walked out of the theater because I, I felt so bad that my wife, my, my sister-in-law were in there. Uh, we watched it for the first time when it, when it first came out. And, and it, it was bad, you know. And I felt, <laughs> I felt good. They left for the bathroom. And I grabbed their purses and we walked out. And I was like, guys, I'm sorry. Like, I didn't know it was going to be that gross. <laughs> so I'm with you, man. <laughs> which I got to know, what was the scene you walked out on? Because I, I got an idea of which one it could have been. So oh, I don't know which one we actually walked out on. I don't know if it was the one that, where they're dancing in the, in the living room, but um, I mean, they, they just, they got out to go to the bathroom and then I was like, man, I'm, I feel bad. I'm making them sit, sit through this. This is pretty gross for these you know, two, two, you know, young girls. Yeah. So, I was uh, assuming it might've been either during the scene where he was drawing dicks, you know, and, and I don't know if, have you watched the whole movie? Well, yeah, of course. Of course okay. Yeah. I've seen yeah. it three times. I don't know what that says about me. Right. <laughs> but I absolutely love it. It's just so stupid. Right. Like it's it's, the, it's so out there. It's so out there. The acting is so perfect. I mean, you actually believe these guys are just as stupid as they as they're acting. Right. I mean, it's, yep. it's absolutely uh, McLovin will live in my heart forever, dude. I mean, oh, every time man. you say super bad, everybody says, oh, McLovin. <laughs> yep. Yep. You know, it's like it's like Animal House for our, for our generation. Yeah, you know, it's it's gonna be around forever. That's what's it's crazy. Dude, I love it. Uh, so so what was your role? I'm trying to so picture role, that you're a clean cut kid right here. So I'm trying to picture what which was your role. Yeah, well, there's a limited uh, market in in Hollywood for uh, guys with prosthetics, and we can go into that in my story after a little while. But yeah. I have a prosthetic leg from a car accident, and that kind of is what spurred my my road to addiction, and. Um, but yeah, so they were, the, the role was a kid with prosthetic leg. And I, here I am, I was 28 years old or so, 27. And I was like, man, I'm just going to give it a try. I didn't even care if I got the role, honestly, because uh, my one word's a curse word and I've got, I've got kids. And I was like, man, I don't know if I want to you know, forever be known for that, for that scene and that word. Uh, for those of you who, who haven't seen it or have seen it, it's a, uh, I run past Jonah Hill on a track scene uh, in the first like 10 minutes in the movie and, and just yell, Pussy is, uh, is my line. Oh, dude, I do remember that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the role is kid with prosthetic leg. And I just wanted to get in front of the casting director because right. Alison Jones cast for all those guys for Seth Rogen and, and Jonah Hill and 
uh, Steve Carell, she cast for all those guys' projects. And I was like, even if I don't get this one role that I'm saying one word in, uh, I don't really care. I just want to get in front of the Allison Jones people. And, and sure enough, I, I showed up and I was like, man, I'm too old for this. I'm 27 years old or however old I was. And, and uh, sure enough, I, I got it. And uh, <laughs> they brought me out and we did it. Well, anyway, here we are. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to have you on the show. Um, uh, sorry for the caveat yeah, to your wife. Uh, you know, but, uh, but the truth of the matter is that we're here to talk about recovery and I'm sure that along the roads, right? Like when we think about, when I think about that movie, super bad too, right? I think about my own addiction and the asinine, ridiculous things that I did, right? The house parties that I threw in my parents' house, right? The times the cops got called, the time I got arrested, you know what I mean? Like it's all, I guess for many of us, at least for those of us that are, that are addicts and alcoholics. Right. You watch something like that and you're like, I remember those days. Yeah, man. You know? It's like a single minded focus. All it was, it was only about getting the liquor, getting the drugs and getting the girls and not getting caught. You know, it's just like the life revolved around that. And you know, that movie just kind of encompasses all that, that it's all about just the, just the party and the, and the forget the work and the school and, and the responsibility. It was just, man, let's just, you know, try to have as much fun and, and get away with as much as possible without getting caught. Correct. Correct. All right, so before we dive, we're, we're going to start diving into your story, and I'm going to start asking you questions, you know, about early addiction, that kind of a thing. But before we dive into that, tell us a little bit about what you have going on right now. What's your normal re- daily routine look like, you know, including recovery? Yeah, so, man, I am so blessed today. Uh, my whole life, I wanted uh, to seek fame and attention, and, and now today, it's, man, what, what can I do to, to help somebody else out? And uh, I'm so blessed to be, be in recovery and be surrounded like people like you and, and be in constant communication with folks like you that help keep me grounded. Um, so today I am a, uh, a director of public outreach for addiction campuses. We operate several uh, uh, first class residential treatment facilities throughout the country. Um, wow. My role is to be able to connect our mission, um, which is treating people with a heart of compassion um, through mental health and substance abuse and addiction um, at our treatment centers and, and our, af- our long term aftercare program that we have set up. And do that through my story and, and be able to, to, you know, I have a unique story and we'll go into some of those details, like I said, of my car accident and uh, family members dying and, and that, those kinds of things. But um, today I, I'm, I'm, I found that I couldn't be anonymous anymore. I started off um, in, you know, doing the, the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and the, the 12 steps have absolutely helped me and I still subscribe to those. But I needed to not be anonymous anymore because I couldn't just be anonymous in meetings like once a week and then only when I'm with around those people. I found for me, I had to be like, I had to be out there all the time public about my, um, my struggles. So I could be, you know, as real as possible, as much as possible. So, um, today and I wake up before I put my leg on, right? So before I put on my prosthesis, I have to put on my spiritual prosthesis. And I say this in group, in group talks all the time is I, if for me to get out of bed, if I don't put my, my prosthetic leg on, I'm out of balance. I'm going to fall. I can hop, you know, so far to the bathroom, the kitchen. So I'm just exhausted. And so I do every single morning before I get out of bed, I'm in prayer. Dear God, thank you. You know, I'm I'm saying third step prayer from the big book. Um, I'm asking God for help. I'm asking God to get, you know, help me get outside of myself and let him take over. And um, I do uh, a devotion every single day. I get a devotion emailed to me that has um, all kinds of stuff from from Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, uh, Buddhist, uh, has a Buddhist approach. It has a Native American approach to it. It's called a... uh, would it be transitions daily? daily? No, it's a, it's a, uh, I've deleted today's. Give me a sec. I promote, um, I pr- it, it is, I promote uh, a week, a daily email that has multiple daily reflections and daily devotions. Yeah, it's basically, yes, yeah, so it's like that. There's a, a gentleman here in Tennessee that put it out and now he started off with a couple dozen people and now it's got, I don't know, five or 6,000 uh, people on his, on his email list. If you guys didn't um, notice, I was just plugging Transitions Daily, just saying. Dude, I'm going to check that out. I want to check out Transitions Daily. <laughs> Absolutely. So I don't, man, I don't get on social media first thing in the morning. That just, that throws me off. If I immediately get, pick up my phone and go to email, go to work email or, or social media, man, it, it just starts me off in a, in a bad way. So it's in prayer, uh, a little bit of meditation, my devotions, and, um, and I'll check my email, my, day, my personal email for that uh, daily devotional that I get. But other than that, it's, uh, it's prayer. And then connecting with my family. It's connecting with, with my wife and kids in the morning, uh, getting them ready for school, eating breakfast, 
Um, and then, then I jump on the computer and, and start with work. You know, that's the cool thing about where we're at today. <clears throat> I think that the fear that we have when we first come into recovery, <clears throat> first get clean, we first stop using drugs, is we start to think that life's going to be boring. You know, and for many of us, we start envisioning your life, right? It's like, oh my God, I'm going to be, a, you know, taking care of kids or going to work and like, I'm going to be a schmo, right? A, a working class or whatever the routine. case may be. Yeah. The routine, right? Oh man, last, yeah, last thing we want is routine when we're... No, absolutely. And with the spontaneity of yeah. waking up in a, you know, what, which dumpster am I going to wake up next to or bunker or whatever exciting adventure we're going to have out there. And then we transition into, into this life where it becomes this beautiful routine, this beautiful routine oh. where we're mindful, where we're grateful, where we have practices, right? Where we start our day intentionally. And, mm. and then from there, once we're centered, once we're connected, then we can go out into the world. Then we can, you know, connect with our family. You know, we're not going to show up at the kitchen table, right? All just disheveled and grouchy and where's my breakfast? And you know, I got to go, right? No, it's, it's like I've already connected with source. My, 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 my energy has just kind of come down. I'm awake. And everything else just kind of seems to fall into place. And I, I, that's the, one of the things that I want to promote. It's very similar to what my life is. You know, I get up in the morning, I, I pray, I meditate, I listen to some sort of a podcast or an audio book that I take notes on. And I'm constantly trying to sharpen my ability to connect with people, my ability to coach, my ability to impact the recovery community, right? So there is that beautiful, like, as boring as it may seem, I wouldn't trade my life the way it is today and how I feel right when I lay my, my head in the pillow at night for anything. Absolutely, man. It's priceless. And, you know, I, I went to extremes. We all go to extremes. I, I went to extremes to being out in Hollywood and trying to be recognized and trying to, you know, get the producers and the, and the A-list actors and the, uh, you know, like Allison Jones casting. I wanted the casting directors to, to want me and to need me. And it's like, man, if I'm an A-lister in my kids' eyes these days, I'm set. If I can be an A-lister in my wife and kids' eyes, everything else is going to come. God's going to bring everything else to me. I don't have to go out and seek it. I just need to seek him and, and, and the truth first and let it flow out from there. And get, out, get the hell out of the way and stay out of the way. <laughs> That's what? the hard thing is staying out of the oh, way. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you're mindful of, like I talk about this a lot, what is the legacy I'm going to leave behind? Period, right? And, and who are the people that... It, I worry about the most, you know, when I leave that legacy, what are they going to say about me, you know, when I'm gone? And, and if I'm pretty clear, if I have an idea of what people are going to say, I can either say, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be living that life today, or I need to tighten a couple of things. You know what I mean? I certainly don't want to be clean and sober and then die of lung cancer because I was smoking for 20 years, mm -hmm. right? So, so what's the legacy I'm going to leave behind, you know, which yep which is awesome. All right. So um, tell us, John, how much clean time do you have and when is your anniversary date? So a little over two years now. This is my longest, this is my longest round. I've had a year, I've had a year and a half, but now I've uh, reached two years on uh, December 22nd, uh, 2017. So my sobriety date's uh, December 22nd, 2015. Excellent. All right. Um, and tell us how old you were the first time you drank or used drugs. And more importantly, how did they make you feel? Man, I was a kind of a late bloomer in my, in my friends in high school. I used to show up at parties with chocolate milk. And man, I didn't need to drink. I'd show up with a carton of chocolate milk and everybody, hey, man, you want something? I'm good. I got, I got my chocolate milk. And so I was kind of a weirdo. And um, <laughs> I really was. All right. I'm going to be different. I'm going to be different. I'm going to do it different. You know, I was brought up in the church and I was, I'm not going to do that kind of stuff. And sure enough, I finally gave in uh, right after junior year right after junior year and we were uh, down at the river. I grew up outside of uh, San Antonio and in South Texas. And uh, we had you know, a lot of, a lot of land friends with land and, and places to go and be outside. So we we're down at the river and uh, first time was, was uh, vodka, orange juice, man, down by the river. And 
it was a feeling of why didn't I do this sooner? Mm -hmm. It was just like this. I mean, of course it did, did taste good. I didn't like the taste, but that warm, just kind of embrace of my soul, my spirit was like, Oh, now I get what you guys are talking about. And I was so scared, so scared for the longest time. And so, man, my chocolate milk was gone, man. (laughs) And so that first night I drank so much, I was puking in the river. And I'd love to tell this story is, uh, so I'm, I'm going I walk, you know, stumble out into the river and my buddy Brad's got his hand over my, on, on my back and, and I'm puking and he's like, Hey man, this is great. This is the greatest thing because look what happens. You don't have to clean anything up. You can just let it out. It'll float right down to you. You don't have to clean a thing up. And I really kind of put that as like a metaphor <laughs> for my, my drinking and using like career was, man, I can do whatever I want to do. I can put whatever I want in my body. Doesn't matter what comes out, but I don't really have to clean anything up. I don't really have to worry about the consequences. And that was kind of a message that was kind of, you know, not on purpose, purposely driven into me, but I took that as, man, I, I don't have to clean anything up. And so it was off to the races, you know, after that and primarily drinking for a couple of years, dabble a little bit in marijuana, but I was, made me paranoid. And so I didn't really do much drugs until after my car accident. Real, real quick, real quick. You said, I'm going to rewind a little bit. You said you felt bad or something like when you started or you started drinking again, you put down the chocolate milk, right? You said, and then I felt bad. Was it like, uh, in the sense of you felt guilty or, or, or what was it? I don't know. You know, just curious. Um, I'm not sure what I, what I meant. Um, okay. All right. I, I caught yeah. something there and then you kept rolling and then we, you probably bypassed the thought, you know yeah. what I mean? But I, I grew up in a very religious household, right? And guilt and shame were just a huge you know, predicator for all my life. Like I, I just like, you know, and so when I started partying, right, it was the same thing, right? Like I felt guilty about the party. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I shouldn't be doing this. Right. I got this dirty secret. I shouldn't be doing right. this. Yeah, absolutely. You show up to church on Sundays. Yeah. My, my grandfather was a Baptist preacher. He was uh, famous oh, in, in his go. circles. He was personal friends of Billy Graham. I mean, Billy Graham sent flowers to his funeral. Um, I've got, I've got a book right back here that uh, Billy Graham gave my parents when they got married. He, he signed it to my mom and dad sitting right back here. Uh, that he gave to, to my parents when they got married. So yeah, I, I grew up around Southern Baptist kind of so lifestyle. Very so religious upbringing. So a lot of guilt and shame around misbehavior. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. All right. All right. So John, you're warmed up, buddy. It's time for me to turn this show over to you. It's time for you to share your story, your battle with drugs and alcohol, the wreckage it caused in your life when you hit rock bottom, and then finally your journey into recovery up until today. So, John, take it away. Man, um, I, I love that. I love opportunities like this. Thank you so much. Um, it's an honor. So long, it was all about me. It was all about me. And now it's just, I, I just want to say, I, I, I thank God for this opportunity. And I, I would pray right before we came on here that. I got to be able to use this for his glory. And so hopefully this, this just helps somebody else out. Um, this isn't about me, but it's about help, help the next person behind me. Um, Absolutely. Me yep. So uh, my story really starts, like I said, high school, started drinking, um, went into senior year, uh, drinking, doing the partying thing. Man, life was manageable, but uh, it, I had this sense of there was something underneath the skin that was always unscratchable. I, you know, there's something always underneath me that I could never put my finger on. And I'll get to that a little bit later on in my story. It took me over a decade to, and a lot of therapy and rehabs to figure it out. And I'll, and I'll touch on that after a little while. But as soon as I put alcohol in my system, it was kind of like this, man, my soul was encompassed in a, in a, in a sense of peace in a way that, that it wasn't otherwise. And so I was able to manage with those uh, uncomfortable feelings and And I was already a social guy. I was already kind of a a class clown and was already kind of out there, but it it just made me even, even more comfortable around people. And, and, um, so I go off to college, uh, was a, uh, Baylor bear, went to Baylor. My parents went to Baylor, you know, private Baptist university. So, you know, um, had that, you know, over my head, having, having the the religion over my head there in, in school, going and doing a partying thing on the weekend, having that, man, I got this secret life which almost made me like want to drink, drink more because now, now I feel guilty for doing that. I better do it again. Do it again. But you know, I, I quickly 
caught on to the alcohol. Uh, I had a girlfriend dump me my senior year in high school and, and I drank for like over 30 days straight, not just drink. I mean, I got, I drank to get drunk for over 30 straight days. And for me being a late bloomer drinking in high school to all of a sudden, man, I, I, I got dumped and I got, somebody didn't want me. And I took that real, that went really deep with me. And um, so I was, I had this, like, I was so proud that I was, I was getting hammered for over 30 straight days in a row. And, and so I, I quickly, you know, got, got on the bandwagon and, and went off to the races, go off to college, uh, joined a fraternity doing the, you know, the drinking thing um, in the frat, nothing too out, outrageous other than the normal <laughs> drinking five or six days a week in college uh, was able to maintain grades able to maintain a social life. Um, I had a job junior, senior year, senior year I had earned a, I was a communications major and I earned a full ride scholarship. So things were going, I mean, perfect. I had things lined up just perfectly. I was had a full ride scholarship. I was doing video for the athletic video staff. So I got the same scholarship the athletes got for not having to put in the work like the athletes. We just did video for football games and practices and basketball games and volleyball games. And so I got to travel with the, with the football team and go to Notre Dame and get down the field and do some fun stuff like that. And so senior year, full ride scholarship, I uh, was Dayton uh, cheerleader, who was our fraternity sweetheart. And I was social chair of our fraternity. Life was perfect. And senior year, set up this cruise. I set up this booze cruise. There was 45 of us or so. <laughs> and we went out of New Orleans. We, uh, we all got in caravans, drove down to New Orleans. We go on this cruise for, you know, four, five, six days. We're coming back from this beautiful cruise that I got to go for free because I set it all up. And so my trip was paid for and we're coming back. Everything changed in seven seconds on March 11th. We're coming up here on the 18th anniversary of my car accident, March 11th, 2000. Um, nobody was drinking or driving a beautiful day out. And we were just coming from, um, from Louisiana back to Waco, back to school <clears throat> and a tire blew out in a friend's car in an in a SUV. And for those of you, I don't, you know, I don't, I, I've started to say this more. I've started to come out of my shell and I'll say it to your audience here. Um, I've been kind of embarrassed about it in the past, but I, it's part of my story. And it was a, it was a Firestone Ford Explorer rollover. We're back in 99, 2000 Firestone tires, tread was separating off the tires, causing Ford Explorers to roll and the company knew about it. And so we were one of those victims of that uh, debacle um, prior to the tires being recalled and Firestone ended up recalling millions of tires. And so there's, you know, lawsuits, um, you know, uh, all across the country for folks who, who were suffered from, from these incidences. And we were one of them. And um, I don't like talking about that because, of course, I went in and um, got a settlement and mismanaged money and, and something uh, that, that, that's still hard for me to, to talk about. But, but I'm willing to talk about it um, more these days. <clears throat> so tire blows out from Firestone Tire. Tread separates. We roll. Witness reports say between six and twelve times um, across I-45 northwest of Houston, and uh, we rolled across uh, the median, across the other side of the interstate. Luckily, missing oncoming traffic, and then in a field on the other side of the interstate, uh, we landed upside down. And I saw my legs. Uh, my legs got out the window somehow and just crushed uh, numerous times. And now, take this off here. So my legs got crushed numerous times, ended up having 14 surgeries over the course of that next year and um, ended up having my leg amputated. So 14 surgeries, we moved body part, we moved muscle around and tried to fix the holes in the foot that were caused from the accident, but ended up um, getting a uh, blow knee prosthesis out of the deal. And I'm actually more mobile and have a better quality of life with a prosthetic. Um, however, it, it's not as easy as it looks on TV. <laughs> not as easy. You know, you see people I running. I would imagine, dude. Doing the Boston Marathon. And I got, you know, I have friends that are the most elite disabled athletes in the world. And they go out and they're doing awesome stuff. But they don't tell you about the blisters and the ingrown mm -hmm. hairs and the bacteria buildup inside these things. And, you know, somebody, you go do some heavy exercise. And next thing you know, you're on crutches for a week or two. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that can be a common kind of thing. Um, but... I had a friend die in the accident and that was uh, pretty traumatic. I, I had only had a one grandparent die in my life up to this point. And so, and I was like 10 when my, my uh, grandfather died. And so I, I hadn't dealt with, with a lot of death and um, to see a friend pretty much pass away. Her name was Ashley Furman. Um, 
and a uh, wonderful family, wonderful uh, girl. She was 19 years old and uh, she was the driver and there was nothing she could have done differently. It was just, uh, you know, it was God's time to, to call her home. And, and um, so that, that was tough. You know, first thing I said when I woke up was, did they cut my leg off and is Ashley okay? And uh, my mom and my parents were there and they said, no, your leg's still there. And um, <laughs> actually the first thing I said was, did they save my boxers? I had just gotten some new boxers the day before. <laughs> I'd just gotten some new Austin Powers boxers the day before. I was wearing them when we had the accident. And they take me in and say, they say, okay, we're going to need to take you in for surgery. We're going to prep you for surgery. We're going to need to cut your clothes off. And I said, what? And she said, uh, we're going to need to cut your clothes off. I said, uh-uh. I said, I just got these Austin Powers boxers yesterday. I said, you wait till you put me under and you rip them off my bloody feet. And uh, so first thing I said, first thing I said, when I came to five hour surgery, <laughs> not did they save my leg or did Ashley die? It was, uh, did they save my boxers, mom? So, did they save the boxers? Uh, yes, they did. Okay. Yes, they did. So no this was happened. not, this was not a drinking accident. This was no. a faulty tire accident. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So talk about being out of control. You know, if, I, I don't know if it would have, if I would have felt better if there was drinking involved, you know, like, well, we, you know, we had it coming, we had it coming to us, but there was something that was just completely out of our control. We had no idea. And, um, and yeah, to, to see your world, my world literally flipping upside down. And I told myself in those moments, I'm going to die right now. Like as the car is flipping, I said, it's, uh, this is my time. And I was waiting for everything to just go to black. I was waiting for everything just, you know, um, and the car stopped upside down and I thought, oh my gosh, it's going to blow up. And so I tried to, get out as quickly as I could. And I went to stand up and I could see my bottom of my foot wrapped around. I could see the bottom. My, it was just kind of hanging on by some fibers. And so I could, so I just threw myself out of the car and I crawled out and um, ended up, ended up having to move back home. So I went from this perfect, perfect, you know, progression through college, had everything going for me. And then boom, this happens. I move back home with mom and dad. I'm isolated in my dad's home office in this hospital bed, my mom emptying my urinal, you know, uh, going surgery after surgery after surgery and uh, pain painkillers, you know, got the painkillers. And I actually didn't, I wasn't really addicted to them at first. You know I mean? I, I needed them. I had to, I had to have them. And I had my mom who was giving me medicine, but back, this is 2000, 2001 when I was going through all these surgeries. And this was prime time for doctors to be writing all these prescriptions. It was boom, boom, boom. But I, I really didn't abuse them at the time because I just, I was just trying to survive. Um, <clears throat> But uh, after, at, at a year and two weeks after the accident, I ended up opting in to amputate. And that's when things got funky. Is I amputated my leg and I graduated six weeks later. I was going to walk the stage to, uh, under, under my own power on a temporary prosthetic. And I was drinking like crazy. And at this point, I was taking a lot of pain pills. And I go in to sign my settlement papers, multi million dollar settlement the day before I graduated college, the day before I was walking the stage. And so it's just kind of a perfect storm. You got alcohol and drugs. You got, man, I just had my leg amputated. I'm about to grad. I just graduated and I just got a bunch of money, kind of like a signing bonus, like signing day for an athlete, you know, I, you know, coming off having a, having an athlete scholarship, dude, I'm puffing my chest out. Look at me. I survived. You know, I survived this accident. You can't kill me. Nothing can kill me. Now I got all this money and you want to go send me out to the real world. I was terrified. I mean, I didn't know it, but I was so freaking terrified of the real world and the fact that I was different and <clears throat> talk about being out of balance, you know, yep. just today being able to, I mean, my world was just completely flipped upside down. I didn't know which way it was up. I didn't know what I was doing. Any decision I made was a terrible decision because it was foggy. Um, I wasn't in the right mindset and I had a great job coming out of college. I had a, I had a great sales job. I mean, really, really well paid. And I quit within like six weeks. I was like, yeah, well, why, why would I need a job? Exactly, man. I'm a millionaire. Exactly, man. I had, you know, I got the company car and the cell phone and laptop. And, you know, this was 2001 and I was going to work and I was like, what is this, man? I was showing up, just hung over. I'm sure I just reeked, you know, I'm sure I just reeked of alcohol showing up. And so when I was like, man, I, I got to be honest with you guys, I, I don't think this thing's for me. I really want to go help other people. That was, that was, that was what was on my heart was to go help other people. Right. When it was really, I just wanted to do nothing. Yeah. Know? No, I mean, I really did have good intentions. Uh, at the time I was like, you know, how can I go help other people? And so I quit the job and I went off and bought a Lexus and BMW and, 
you know, riding high there in the, in Dallas. And, and so I started researching and I found out I could get a master's in counseling. I was like, well, you know, I like, to, I like people, I like helping people. Um, my grandfather was a pastor, you know, this is kind of a long ways of helping people. And so my heart I had good intentions, but I, I was uh, just completely disheveled in, in my thinking and, and in my, um, and, and the way I went about life. And so I moved out to San Diego uh, to work on a master's, my master's in counseling. And so that further progressed me from uh, to isolation from everybody that I knew in Texas growing up. That was, you know, my, my safety net was, was Texas. And to leave that, to go out by myself to California was terrifying. <clears throat> and so I dealt with it through um, prescription pills, through uh, the pain pills, the alcohol, marijuana, I had easy access to marijuana. And then, um, then I couldn't focus because of this stuff that I'm on. And so I get Adderall, I get prescribed Adderall for ADHD. And I mean, I really don't have ADHD. It was just kind of self-imposed. Like I, I, know. I don't take it. I don't take that stuff now. And I'm able to focus just fine when I'm in a med, you know, when I can meditate and I can right. pray and I can have some balance in my life and, you know, diet and exercise help out. But, um, but back then I was sort of just out of whack. And so then I got Adderall. So then I'm sucking down you know, 30 days of Adderall in seven or eight days, not sleeping for days at a time, taking sleeping pills to offset, not being able to sleep from that. And, you know, I'm waking up in the middle of my condo. So I buy a condo, San Diego, Mission Bay, I'm in grad school. And I got my own freaking half million dollar condo with a view of Mission Bay. <clears throat> what else could you want? What else could you want? Right. And, um, Everything looked good on the surface. I had everything on paper looking great. My grades were fine. Um, was engaged to my wife of uh, 13 years now. We were engaged and, and dating, but we were in separate states. And she had no idea what my world was like because we just saw each other for short periods of time on weekends or holidays. The double and, life again. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. It was bad. It was bad. And I was, I was doing some charity work, working, working for a, a charity called the Challenge Athletes Foundation that I, I'm still involved with. And, we raise money to people um, access to sports uh, that are struggling with physical disabilities. And so everything looked great on paper, working for a nonprofit, get a master's in counseling. But behind the scenes, man, I was passing out in my living room. I had the big screen TV. I had the 65 inch screen TV I had delivered to the house and I'm in there by myself alone, completely isolated, drinking, popping pills, passing out. Nobody even knew what was going on because I was by myself, you know? Um, and so it just kind of uh, progressed from there. My wife I get married. My wife moves in. Now I'm under the, now I'm under more pressure. Now oh, I gotta, yeah. now I gotta, now I gotta work harder to hide it. And she could never put her finger on it. Cause I would bounce around from one substance to the other just to try not to get caught. And so she did take her maybe six months for her to fly home to her parents and go, mom, dad, something's not adding up. And I don't know what it is, but it, he's not who I thought I was getting into a relationship with. Right. And luckily her parents you know, pushed for, uh, for her to do anything and everything that she could, could before leaving. And I would have left me after two years. Yes. And she, she's still, I'm just a godsend that, that my wife, Sarah is still with me. Um, the reason why, why I've made so much progress is because I had somebody to just believe in me, even when I couldn't believe myself to go, dude, you, you can do this. And um, it hasn't always been easy. And it's still not easy today, two years sober. It's, it, we still have, you know, st stuff that we struggle with, but, um, but, uh, but we're not going through it alone. You know, we're, we're open about it and we have help. So I get to the end of the master's program and I, I subconsciously knew there's no way I can go help other people. You know, it was really a diversion for me to have to look at my own stuff. Let me look at other people's problems and try to help them with their problems. So I don't really have to look at my own. And I get to graduation. I'm going, oh, crud, man. How am I supposed to help other people? Like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing too good. But I didn't know how bad I was. You know, we, we don't really see it ourselves. We don't see how bad we are ourselves no. and, and till, uh, until the right, you know, until we get a bunch of consequences. I didn't have any consequences at this point other than relationship, you know, some relationship issues with my wife. And so right, at, right as I'm about to graduate in May, my cousin calls me up. He's an actor. Uh, he's on the show, uh, The Arrangement. I got to put a shameless plug. His name is Josh Henderson. Uh, he's on the show, The Arrangement. Season two is coming out here in March on E. It's on the E Network. And he's the lead uh, character in that. So he calls me up and says, hey, man, Stephen Bochco, huge time, you know, 10-time Emmy, Emmy Award winner, um, is doing a show. I'm the lead in it. It's called Over There. And it's based on the war in Iraq. And I'm going to lose my right leg below the knee in this dramatic scene at the end of the first episode, this roadside bomb. Can you help me connect emotionally with my character with what you went through in your car accident? And I said, 
yeah, dude, yeah, I can help you with that. Kind of, that sounds cool. So one thing led to another. Um, I said, what are they going to do for your leg shots? And he said, I don't know, probably computer. And he goes, what leg are you? And I said, right leg below the knee. And he goes, well, yeah, it's my character, right leg below the knee. We both have blonde hair, about the same height, both kind of similar look. They end up hiring me on for his uh, for a technical consultant. So his body double, stunt double, uh, they would have me advise, you know, on, on set to make sure things looked right. What kind of prosthetic would he have at this point in his recovery? Um, you know, he wants to go back and fight overseas. He's addicted to painkillers. What would that look like? And I'm <laughs> sitting there going, shit. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> He's addicted to painkillers. And oh, I, wow. uh, I, don't, I don't know what that looks like. Uh, maybe it would look like this. And uh, so it was, it was cool, man. We got, we got wow. you know, People Magazine and national media came out and blew the, blew the story up. First Cousins working on this show. Amputee, I'm able to promote the Challenge Athletes Foundation through this. The Botchko, Stephen Botchko and his wonderful wife, Dana, uh, did a fundraiser for us. And at the drop of a hat, um, they raised like $45,000. And, you know, that, that was a huge deal for us at that, at that point in time to have, have that kind of support. I was like, man. I'm going to move up to LA and do this full time. So drag my wife kicking and screaming. She, I don't want to go to LA. I don't, you know, she was a nanny. She was doing nanny for this wonderful family in San Diego. We had this, you know, nice little condo and she wants, you know, I'm dragging her up to LA. Do you keep the and condo? We kept the condo. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we have a condo in LA and a condo in San Diego. Okay. I got some land in Texas. Ego, you know, mm -hmm. ego's built up. Here we go. Now I've been, been in People Magazine. People saw me. People know me. And my cousin knows people. So I've coattailed on my cousin. We've been, I've been bowling at Phil Jackson's house. And, uh, you know, we've, we've got Andy Dick. We've got a crazy Andy Dick got in a cab with him one time. And he, he was licking me and my wife and trying oh. to pick us both up at the same time. And he's like, you guys are beautiful. And we're like, dude, get the freak out of here. Yeah, we yeah, actually yeah. left. We actually left him in the hills, man. It was a, a New Year's thing. It's a, a long story, but um, so we started having, you know, had some interesting times out there. I got an agent and landed roles on NCIS and Cold Case and ER and JAG. And um, man, my ego is getting built up. And I was seeking that fame, seeking that attention from all these other people. And I was just demoralized inside. I mean, I was filthy, dirty. I felt so yeah. heavy. Yep. I felt uh, the, the post traumatic stress and the, the anxiety and the depression was all just building up and it was just getting worse and worse. And, uh, but on the outside, everything was looking great. Had that picture perfect, you know, smile and, and look, and man, we got to the playboy mansion <clears throat> at the end of 2008, we got invited to, uh, the, the premiere for house bunny. Uh, Catherine McPhee was our next door neighbor. Um, we had, we had keys to her place. She had keys to our place. We'd take each other's dogs out. Living the dream, man. She was at the, she was at the hospital when my son was born. You know, hanging out with Catherine McPhee. She's in the movie House Bunny. She says, hey, I, we got the premiere coming on. Y'all want to come with? Like, yeah, sure. So being that, uh, you know, Hugh Hefner and the girls were, were in the film and they filmed part of the movie at the, at the Playboy Mansion. We got to go to the premiere and we're in the theater with Adam Sandler and Bruce Willis and all these people. And then we get to go to the Playboy Mansion after that. And what kid, I mean, look at this. What kid doesn't want to be, have millions of dollars, have, you know, have a condo in LA, live in next to celebrities, bowling at phil jackson's house doing all these things and go get to the playboy mansion as a stunt person I, i've been you know i'm in films getting blown up and blood and guts everywhere i'm like dude this is the life this is what i always wanted and it was all right there for the taking man i had it and after the playboy mansion with adam sandler you're taking shots with adam sandler it was the high life it was a highlight of my life and career at that point and it all freaking came down and it had nothing to do with me, it had nothing to do with my leg or my car accident. But I got a call that my brother, um, he was my best friend and my only sibling. And he lived uh, just seven miles over the hill. He lived in Beverly Hills. We lived on the backside of the hills and I got a call that he didn't show up for work one day. And uh, that wasn't like him. And I mean, he was freaking brilliant. MBA from Georgetown, smart guy, charismatic. Everybody loved him but he struggled with addiction for years and years mm -hmm. and we didn't talk about it as a family. The f he died of an overdose alone and isolated in his Beverly Hills home door locked to his bedroom. I go over to his house, kick in the door and find my best friend had been dead for three days oh. laying face down on the, on the ground. And, um, That's a tough moment.
that's worse than my leg, worse than anything that I had already gone through was that you can't, you can't get a prosthetic for a, somebody who dies from an overdose. You know, you there's no prosthetic for that. And there's no forgetting that. No, it, you know, it's one thing for him to die. One thing you're going to die unexpectedly, but to find them. Yep. And so there are 144 people dying of overdoses a day. Somebody is finding these people. Somebody has to find somebody who, who overdoses a friend, a family member, a landlord, who, you know, whoever it is, a police officer, somebody, you know, a first responder is finding these people every single day. It is just it's so traumatic. And I know whenever I hear somebody die of an overdose on the news, I'm like, that whole family is just completely, you know, the ripple effect is, is so heavy. And so, man, it, it sucked. That sucked. Um, but the drugs didn't kill my brother. The, it was absolutely not. The, the overdose didn't kill my brother. It was the stigma that stigma with addiction, that that's why I have to talk about it. That's why I have to put my story out there. That's why I'm so grateful for this opportunity. If I help one, if we help one person through this, you know, hour and a half time that we have together, it is absolutely worth it. Um, that, that people don't need to go through, don't, don't need to go to the extreme of, of, of death to be able to get help and, and, and to know that they can surround themselves with the community that cares about them. Um, so my brother, as smart as he was, didn't matter what religion we were brought up in or what church addiction is addiction. It's, it wants to kill us. And, um, so after my brother died, we got out of LA, let's move, let's move to Nashville. My wife's from Chicago. I'm from Texas. It was too cold, too hot. Where could we go in the middle? So we ended up in Nashville and, um, I just brought, brought me with me, brought my same problems here. And, uh, I got a job with Dave Ramsey. If anybody out there knows who Dave Ramsey is, the uh, personal finance guy, get people uh, out of debt, you know, total that. money makeover. No debt. <laughs> No, yeah, exactly. No credit cards, no debt, pay cash. And so he has a, he has a you know, uh, high powered, uh, high energy, high octane organization, uh, right 15 minutes from here uh, in the Nashville area, Christian organization. I thought, man, that's the kind of place I need to be. That's the kind of place that where, where I can, I can really flourish. Um, but when you're drinking on the way to work, you're drinking at work, you're popping pills. Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter what environment your work environment you're in. It's just a matter of time. And my, my addiction had progressed enough to where it was, it was blatant, blatantly obvious that I had a problem. And um, so he, I got called into his office one day and he said, look, man, he said, I, I can't help you in, in the way that you need help. But what I can do is I can let you go and I can let you go get the help that you need. And so that was my, this was Dave call. Ramsey. This is Dave Ramsey. You got let go by Dave Ramsey in person. Face to face. I get wow. called into his office. We're sitting around the round table. He's got this round table. We got HR, my manager, my manager's manager and Dave. And, uh, you know, they had, a, they had enough documentation of, you know, just poor performance, yeah. you know, making excuses, you know, working, working late because I wasn't pulling my weight during normal work hours because I'm, you know, kind of fuzzy, you know, um, taking days off when I, you know, more days off than I needed to, things like that. <clears throat> and then, uh, so it was, it was, it was, a, it was time. It was time for me to, to finally for the first time, raised my hand, said, man, this thing's bigger than me and I need help. And so that was 2011 and went to my first inpatient treatment, just terrified. I was so scared and I'd never been to treatment before. I didn't, you know, first one in the family to do it, you know, kind of breaking the seal for anybody in my family. But, um, but we, of course we kept it quiet. Don't let anybody know. And I went to a celebrity treatment place out in Arizona, you know, if you pay more, then you get sober quicker and, and longer. Right? That's what I thought. <laughs> right. You know, right? <laughs> so I had, I had Reiki massage. I had oh. uh, pool volleyball. Oh. We had, you know, all the bells and whistles. You all the tough love. Uh, exactly. You possibly, <laughs> you know, expect, you know, From at high, you know for, center. Well, and the more, the more money you pay, the, I feel like the less deep you, you actually course. get in, in your, in your work because mm -hmm. they don't want to piss you off. So then you're not going to pay your bill. Correct. You know, so they, you know, baby you, they babied me through it. And, but it was my first experience. I didn't, I didn't know what to expect. And so I, 45 days on a trauma pro trauma track, you know, got you this, go? uh, Sierra Tucson. Okay. Sierra Tucson. Yeah. And, um, you know, there were some, some people with names there and, and it made me feel cool to you know be around them and just ego serving. Uh, but I did, st I did step one, um, and it was about 40, it took me about 45 minutes to present in front of the group. It was about 12 questions. Contrast that with uh, I get home, I, I drink within three days, and 
didn't fully understand it. Like I can't ever drink again. I just thought I just need to kind of clear up a little bit, clear my mind for 45 days. And then I, I could dabble a little bit. And so I'm, I'm still taking some of the medications that I shouldn't be taking like, you know, Adderall or Vyvanse and, and, and drinking, you know, picked up pretty quickly after that again. And so then I'm in an outpatient facility here, uh, <laughs> here in Nashville and I get to the end of the six week program and the counselors are like, well, why don't you bring your wife in? We, we want to kind of just kind of a little sit down thing. I'm like, okay. So we walk in and they're like, uh, we want to recommend that John go to, uh, to another, another facility. We, we think he might need some more, more help. And we're going, what are you talking about? We just spent like tens of thousands of dollars at this place. And now he's an outpatient. What's the problem? I mean, shouldn't y'all have fixed him? Like, shouldn't he be fixed by now? And they're like, yeah, we think there's some deeper issues that haven't been, you know, haven't been touched yet. So kicking and screaming, I went to a place that they recommended out here and uh, it's called still waters. And it's, uh, it's rehab for big boys is what they call it. And it's 12 steps the way they used to do it when the low bottom drunks, when AA first started and you are about to die in the streets and you're in the gutter and they pull you out and they say, you are going to need to look at the truth. We are going to help you do that. We are here to support you. It's not going to be pretty, but here's what, here's what you're going to do. You're going to do the first seven, seven steps before you can consider leaving this place. And I'm freaking terrified. Okay. Step one was 70 questions and it took me 12 hours to present it to the group over three days. And you sat in this chair and they had a table in the middle with all the, there's about 10 to 12 guys or 10 to 15 guys in the room and they had this snake sitting on this table, this rattlesnake, the stuffed rattlesnake curled up with its fangs facing you. And behind that was the counselor. And they sat there with this book later on. It's a, it's the narcotics yeah, anonymous step, step working guide. Step working guide. Mm -hmm. And we worked through this very diligently. And step one, again, 12 hours, I got through that. Step two, I'm working through it, I'm working through it. And, but they grill you. These guys, they care about you. And they, on step two, the counselor, he throws his book down and he goes, John, I'm going to tell you something nobody out there is going to tell you. All you are in your addiction is a crippled effing drunk. That's all you are. If you can come to terms with that, 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 rea that that's your reality, then maybe you can start making some progress. But you're all thinking you're all Hollywood and you're all this and you're all that. And I got, I got, I can pay the bills. And I don't have any problems and I can buy my way out of anything because you're never going to recover. You're never going to get sober and you're going to die and you're going to be buried next to your brother. And I'm telling you this out of love, not out of hate or spite. And I'm just freaking tears. Just, you know, nobody's ever talked to me like that. I've been able to get whatever pills I want, whatever doctors I want to go to, whatever excuse I want to make. I found my brother dead and I lost my leg and I saw my friend die. I could use that all day long and nobody was going to question me until I got into a program where they actually cared. And they said, you we're going to save you from dying and being buried next to your brother. Here's the truth. The truth is, man, you need a lot of help and you need to really start from scratch. And you're just, you're just a guard variety drunk like the rest of us. And that was so huge, man. Um, and I didn't stay sober completely, you know, uh, I've re relapsed since then, but that was a huge turning point in my recovery. Um, and so I came out, had about a year, year and a half sobriety after that, um, relapsed. And then I went to here, here's a big point. I want to make sure the audience hears childhood trauma. I had no idea that I had experienced childhood trauma and I had no idea that it could be longstanding and it could be dry, a driving force in my still needing to, uh, numb out with drugs and alcohol, even after several rounds of, of inpatient treatment. But I, I'm absolutely, um, a poster child for childhood trauma not being addressed and how it can affect you later on. And here's, here's what happened. Called this trauma therapist not too far from here. And I had a phone consultation with her. I said, found my brother dead, had a friend die, lost my late car accident, blah, blah, blah. And she was 10 minutes into, into my story. She said, you know, thank you for telling me that. I really appreciate it, but um, I don't really care. I don't really care about that stuff. She said it more nicely. What I heard was I don't care about that stuff, but she goes, what I do care about is what happened to you as a child. And I only had a 10 minute conversation with her and I told her what happened in my traumas. And, she, and, and I said, what are you talking about? Like I had a really good childhood. I brought up in the church and a great family and my parents are still married and this, you know, it was very supportive. She was, I'm sure you had a really great childhood. What happened? I'm like, what are you talking about? The only thing I could think of after she, you know, pushed me three or four times was what happened? What happened? And I said, I don't know. Like I, I had some ear surgeries as a kid, but like that wasn't a big deal. It was a long time ago. And she said, boom. When you come in next week, that's where we're starting because I guarantee you that's where your problem started. 
I'm going, what? What is this lady talking about? Like, don't waste my time. So I go in, I sit down with her, and over the course of four or five sessions, so she brings me plain white paper and crayons. And here I am. I've been Playboy Mansion shooting, you know, you know, liquor with Adam Sandler, and I got a bank account, and I got all this stuff, and I got a wife and kids, and everything's looking great. And I got myself together, and I'm sitting here in this office, this cold, like brick, red brick office. It's, it's just damp and cold in there, and this lady's got kind of frizzy hair, and uh, just books with dirt, you know, dust everywhere. And she says, "Here's some paper and crayons. I want you to draw what you remember from your first surgery. What was that like for you?" I was like, "Man, I, don't, I can't draw." She goes, "I don't care. You don't need to. You stick figures. Doesn't matter." So over the course of four or five sessions, we drew out this storyboard, and it's called a graphic narrative. I've since learned. And I was able to draw out what I remember and what came out of that. And then what, then what she did, she put these up on the wall. She put the papers up on a wall in order. And I was able to tell the story back to her. So I was able to, one, get it out. And then I was able to talk about it from afar. So it's not a part of me. It's, it's, it's up there. It's, it's not me. It's that's something that happened, but it's not my reality today. And so that process is called a graphic narrative. And it, it was profound. And I was able to learn through that experience that from an early childhood, I felt defective, I felt different, I felt scared, I felt broken and unfixable. And what happened was I had six ear surgeries from ages like six to 15, and I have a transplanted eardrum in my left ear, and I have the three bones in my left ear, prosthetic bones. And so I had to fly from Texas to Oklahoma to the specialist to do this. And so as a child, I felt like I was being flown to Mars, and these aliens were probing into my brain. And I have scars behind my ear where they, they would lay my ear back. And then I'd have you know, pus and blood coming out for weeks at a time. And it was painful. And so absolutely from, from early childhood, I felt, man, something's wrong with me. I'm not quite right. I'm different. And so I think, I think a lot of us can, I, you know, I've talked to a lot of people in recovery these days. And they go back to, if you really go and ask them, man, back in childhood, something was wrong. Something was off. It could be parents fighting. It could be bullying in school. It could be not living up to parents' expectations and, and being, you know, physically or uh, emotionally abused. Sexual abuse is a big one, of course. Um, any of these things can add up over time and uh, cause somebody to need to uh, be more apt to becoming an alcoholic or an addict uh, later on in life. And so I just try to encourage people as much as I can to go back and look at childhood stuff. If maybe you had something that you never even thought of before, that could be a driving force for you today. So through this process, through these processes, man, I've tried EMDR, brain spotting, essential oils. I just, I was willing to try anything to get, uh, the medical community wasn't doing it for me. I was, I kept going to doctors, I kept trying to get medications and it just wasn't working for me. And so I started trying some holistic stuff. Started for the first time being open to meditation, to yoga, um, to like essential oils have been really big for me. Um, doTERRA essential oils are, is, is a brand that I use I mean, a daily basis. I use essential oils on a daily basis. And I've gone from 11 medications to two, really one on a one every day. I pick one medication every day and one uh, as needed. Um, but uh, I found out that, man, there are healthy ways to be able to deal. Oh, oh, let me talk about boxing, physical exercise. So physical <laughs> exercise has always been something that I needed. But uh, my last relapse was a little over two years ago. I had nerve pain in my leg. I went to a doctor to get a medication. I, could, I couldn't figure this out, and I got um, uh, Klonopin. He knows I'm in recovery. We talked about it. We knew I couldn't have pain pills. He said, Klonopin, this isn't good for people who are, you know, who are, are you know, apt to being uh, addicted. But I'm willing to give it to you if you give it to your wife. His, my wife knows his wife. I said, give it to me. I, yes, I got this. Never really had Klonopin on a regular basis. I got this. Even with, you know, multiple rounds of treatment under my belt, I got it. I didn't give it to my wife. Three days later, I passed out in a prosthetic doctor's office. I'm, I'm getting my leg worked on. And I passed out in the doctor's office because I took too much Klonopin. It took three days for me to get something new, put something outside of myself to help. I had emotional and physical pain, you know, at the same time from this nerve pain. And I just need to numb out. And it didn't take long for that relapse to happen. Boom. I was on a plane the next day to an addiction campuses facility. I'm wearing the shirt. They are family there. I'm there. And what made addiction campuses stand out to me over the other facilities is, is the staff. Within three days, everybody knew me by first name. And I won't, I won't go into all the details, but it was just uh, absolutely a, a family environment. But the one thing that they had there that I had never tried before, never done before, 
I found serenity and peace in my soul through a punching bag. Mm. They had a punching bag there in the, in the workout room. I'd never done it before. I'm not an angry person, but I had a lot of anger mm. built up inside of me. I had a lot of energy that I just suppressed for so long. Mm -hmm. And I got a hold of this punching bag and I just started wailing on it, man. And it had this release that was like, Oh my gosh, I've got to have this more. So I came home and I've been a member at title boxing, my local title boxing club for the last two years. And they freaking asked me, this is such an honor. They asked me if I wanted to be a trainer a few months back. They're like, dude, you've got this thing down. Would you want to be a trainer and help motivate people? And I'm like, man, and I, one, I don't have time, but I'm completely honored that you would ask me. Um, but title boxing has over 150 clubs around the country. And they're, I'm actually going to be featured as their national kind of story here uh, in April. Uh, coming up here in April, they're going to be featuring me. And uh, it's, it's an honor to be able to do that. And so I say that story to let people know, try something new, man. If you're, if you're kind of stuck, one, if you're stuck in your recovery or if you're stuck in your addiction, be willing to try something new. Have an open mind to trying something different. I thought meditation was weird. I thought it was for the hippie Californians, like, you know, the weird Californians like you. Like, oh, uh, <laughs> they are a little weird. <laughs> they are a little different. Even when I lived there, I was like, I'm not trying meditation. That's, you know, I grew up in the church. We, yeah. You know, you got to go to the church to pray. It's like, man, I can meditate when I'm, you know, doing laundry or when I'm in the shower, I can just meditate. You know, we can do it driving in the car. Mm -hmm. um, I use the app, uh, Heads, uh, Headspace. Headspace is the app that, that's been um, one that I've gravitated toward. It's been huge for me. Um, so I meditate every single day. Yeah not every single day, six days a week, probably. And, uh, and a boxing, um, four, four or five days a week. And that helps, helps bring me in, man. It helps me let that energy out. Um, so that's been huge for me. And so life today is I have a freaking full-time job. I have a job that I'm not getting fired from. And I got called into the office last year. <laughs> last year. They're like, oh, John, when you talk to you, I'm going, Oh no, here we go. Here we go. I've, I've been through this drill before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I tensed up. I'm like, oh man, what's gonna happen? And they go in. They said, hey man, we want to know if uh, we want to offer you a promotion. We want to offer you a little bit more responsibility, and we want to give you a podcast. Would you be willing to, to host a podcast? We think you'd be great to to do that. And so, man, through through the you know through God doing for me what I can't do for myself, and the people, the team of people that I've surrounded myself with today. Um, I'm, I'm host of the High Sobriety Podcast. Um, I get to do public speaking. I mean. Uh, every single week I'm, I'm talking somewhere else at a different school or a community event. Um, uh, it's just a, it's a whole new world and it freaks me out. I got to say this. I'm, it's scary, man. It's scary when you start making progress and God's doing stuff for me. And so I have to keep up in my game and my prayer. I got to keep up in meditation. I got to keep up in my communication with my sponsor, you know, like, man, I'm getting, I'm getting kind of scared, man. Things are, are really rolling. This is when I, I'm really good at sabotaging things, you know? So, but, uh, one, one point that I love making is, you know, in Hollywood, everybody wants a team around them. You know, if, if you're going to be serious about the acting, you need a team, you need, you know, your co acting coach or coaches, your agent, your manager, your publicist, uh, you know, we get to a certain level, you get a cook and a, and a personal trainer and all that, you know, nutritionist and all that stuff. And I wanted that. I wanted that. And I have that today in, in recovery. I have a team of people around me. I have ther multiple therapists. I have, you know, my trainers at the gym that I can check in with on a regular basis. And they're there to help motivate me and help encourage me. I have, you know, pastor at church. I have my wife. I have my family members. I have a sponsor. I have friends in recovery. I have coworkers. I had to get into a job where this is my life so that I can constantly be around it. And for me, it wasn't work. It wasn't going to work. I don't think for me to uh, be... John in recovery in an, in a 12 step meeting in a basement for one hour a day and then have to go to a normal regular job. Cause I actually did that for, um, for a little while after a couple of rounds of my treatment is I went to a normal business route and, and, and helped, uh, uh, invent, I invented a product for prosthetics actually. And, um, and that was really cool. But, but I, I went backwards after that because it was, the stress was getting to me and I, and I wasn't in an environment that was healthy for me and I wasn't working a program. And I was just trying to do it all myself. And so now I, I find that I've got to work in the field. I've got to, I've got to be helping people and be honest on a, on a consistent basis uh, to be able to help hold myself accountable. So that's your story. <sighs> Man, thank you guys for listening. Those, those that are tuning in, thank you so much for helping keep me sober uh, today. I appreciate it. 
What an amazing story. There's so many takeaways. There's so many pivots in your life. Um, you know, after going through that, uh, after going through Sierra Tucson, right? Very intense 12 step experience. And I remember myself, you know, as soon as you started, as soon as you said 68 questions, I, I mean, 70 questions, I'm like, I think it's 68 questions, but yeah, you know, yeah, I'll round it up. The first step, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, no, no. But it, I go, he, I go, he must have done it through the NA step working guide, right? And and I remember it took me, uh, it actually took me four years to do it. I had a job, and and I would meet with my sponsor every week, and we we would go over the step work. But it changed my life, right? Yeah, it, it's so intrusive. Right, like it, every question, right, takes you down yet another the just, layers, just another layer, and so each step, and you know, you you get an opportunity to live in that step while you're working it. So it's not like you, I'm done working step one in 15 minutes or in an hour or in a day, right? It's going to take me, you know, a couple of weeks, maybe a month, maybe more to get through that yeah. first step yeah. and answer those questions. And in the meantime, I'm literally living in that step. I'm living in that first step and I'm getting an opportunity to understand what it's like for, my, for me to embrace the idea of being powerless, to, for, to embrace the idea of my life being unmanageable, internal unmanageability, external unmanageability, all these different terms that we learn that if you bypass the, pro, the process, then really just the awareness that I'm an alcoholic or an addict didn't serve me before. It's not going to serve me now. It's not going to prevent me. But if I, if I have this understanding of, you know, what it is that I'm up against, right, through working that first step. So curious. So you get through Sierra Tucson. Uh, you got through the first seven steps in there, right? You couldn't leave until. Uh, no, no. So Sierra Tucson was just really step one. I mean, I just, I really did step one, maybe, maybe two. I think, it, no, I think I did some step two. Um, but there was real surface, just surface level stuff. Which was and the one that was the. It's called uh, Still Waters. Still Waters. Oh, Still Waters. Okay. Yeah, Still Waters was the second Scratch one. Scratch that. Sierra Tucson was the cakewalk. All right. So Still Waters is the one where they they, they real recovery for for real men. So how Yo, far along did you get before you leave? Before you left? Seven through step seven. Okay, got through yeah. step seven, and then how long before you relapse? About a year and a half. And I didn't do nine. I got hung up on nine. I didn't, I didn't do any amends. I'll, I'll get to those, you know. Um, Did you end up making those? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. We've done them. Yes. We've done them now. All right. All right. Now. This, is what, this is the key of the, of the interviews really is to understand where the breakdown happens, right? Where the missed opportunities happen, where we, we're, where we veered off course, right? And ended up in the, in the, in the relapse. Right. And the, and the reality of it is, is that all these things are just stacked against you, right? The notoriety, the money, you know, the name dropping, right. The whole, the whole social construct, right. It, it allows the ego to just thrive mercilessly, oh. right. It just allows the ego to just be talking to you on a, on a regular basis. Right. And, and saying, we don't need this. We got this. Let's move on. This is what's important. Um, and, and, and ultimately leads to the relapse. So then you relapsed. How long did the relapse last? Um, after Stillwaters, mm -hmm. about six weeks. Okay. Okay. So that's, 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 that's another very important part of the story, right? Because there's people that will relapse and it takes them on a 10 year bender. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there was that six week period of time. Right. And so my next question logically would be like, why was it so short? Got caught. Got was, caught. Yes. Yeah. I was okay. drinking. I was drinking and uh, um, driving uh, the family up to the next exit to go run some errands and swerving. Drinking and driving with the family in the car. Yes. Oh, six dude. weeks. Took six weeks to start. To get to that level already. Yeah, okay. yeah, to not work. It's like I don't even care. You right. Know? No, I care about didn't care about other people's well being. And um, so So then so you got yeah. caught and then what was the next step? Go to meetings, talk to your sponsor, go to rehab again. I, I got to went into rehab again. Okay. And how long that were you was, in there? Uh that was thirty days. Thirty days in? Thirty days in, yeah. 
Where? Stillwaters again? No, so it's uh, Cumberland Heights. It's here in the Nashville area. Okay. And Stillwaters is a is, is a Cumberland Heights treatment facility. Great. That's not on campus. It's it's in another it's in another location. So it was another uh, Cumberland Heights facility. I went to their main campus. So overview, right? So let's let's broad strokes this, right? I recognize that I have a problem, right? I, I end up in one rehab. It doesn't work. I end up in another rehab. Um, I allow myself to embrace the process. Process changes my life, okay? Like going through those particular steps. I relapse. I get caught. I go through it again. But then there's this other section where you go through the childhood trauma. The, the childhood trauma, where was that in retrospect in, 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 in regards to... Was it before the last relapse or was it after the last relapse? Before. Okay. So you, you'd gone in. I'd gone and done that. Yep. Okay. All right. So what do you feel of all these things, right? Because here's the thing with share, right? Share is, is all inclusive. It's all encompassing, right? We talk recovery in all pathways. Okay. So whether for you, it's 12 steps or yoga or meditation or therapy or childhood trauma or whatever the case may be, right? What would you say that looking back now, two and a half years later, right? If you think about the things that you have experienced and the, and the treatments that you have received, there's been therapists, there's been this childhood trauma therapist, there's been 12 step recovery, there's been actual treatment centers. What do you feel has been the most impactful in your life? Um, I would say being surrounded by other people, being surrounded by other, by other folks um, and not allowing myself to consistently communicate with others mm. and allowing people to help me, if that makes sense. So reaching out. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Staying Just connected. Letting, people know, letting, know, letting people know what okay. the hell is going on. So, so, when it, so in, in reference to, because I know that you're not anonymous. I'm not anonymous either, but I go to 12-step meetings every week, right? Like I'm still an AA, I'm still an NA. And if the question of anonymity comes up, it's like I am not promoting my fellowship, right? I, I, I'm a 12-step member. That's how I got clean and sober. That's it. That's all I'm saying, right? And this is my journey. It's my story. Right. So, so I'm not, I'm not sitting here promoting the 12. Yeah, you're not, you're not saying, Hey, come right. on at 12 o'clock and show up at this meeting. I'll meet you there. Yeah. But I know this, I know this, right? Like, I don't want to take a chance. I'm, I'm, I'm this may I'll celebrate 15 years clean and sober. And I have not missed more than I would say uh, the most I have missed consecutively would be two weeks of going to a meeting right? Over the last going on 15 years, right? Um, nice. So is it, is it the fact that I still go to meetings regularly? Is it the fact that I still have a sponsor? Is it still, is it the fact that I still sponsor guys? It's the fact that I, I, I air the share podcast and I talk recovery, you know, like we're doing right now every week. Is it because I'm in, I have the share podcast, private accountability group, the share recovery network, which is a private Facebook group. All we do, it's all about recovery. It's all about these kinds of conversations right? Like, is it, is it one of those things? Is it all of those things? All I know is that for me, as long as I keep doing those things, so far I have enough evidence to prove that it's, that it's this routine and it's this schedule, right? And these habits, these new habits that I've formed that have allowed me to stay clean and sober without any relapse over these years. You know, that's what I'm saying. So um, I, I know when you said that you're like, I'm not anonymous anymore, but do you still regularly attend meetings? Um, not on a, I'll, I'll just be honest, not on a weekly basis. No. Um, I, and this is not a judgment call here. This yeah, is just, no, no. I'm just yeah. Asking. And I'll tell you why. Yeah. You know, and, and I've got no problem <laughs> saying it. No. And, and I found my sponsor about it. I'm like, man, I don't, I don't feel the need to go to as many meetings mm -hmm. as, as I used to, but here's the key. Here's what I've learned. And here's what I've, I have a conscious understanding of is if anybody's read the book by Johan Hari, uh, called chasing the scream. And we're seeing the video called the rat. Have you seen the rat park addiction video? Yes. Have it? Yes. So cool. I show that in almost every single one of my talks, it's a little five minute video. And what it shows is that there was a, a, they put a rat in a cage 
and they gave it water or water laced with heroin or cocaine, every single time a rat in a cage by itself is going to drink itself to death with the water laced with heroin or cocaine every single time. Then they put the rat in a cage with a family with a bunch of rats and they built rat park and it was like heaven for rats. And they had other rats to play with and have sex with and balls to play with and tunnels to scamper down. Not one rat in that rat park ever drank itself to death and not one rat ever used the heroin laced water compulsively. And they determined that it was a connection, that it wasn't the, the chemical hooks on the drug that hooked somebody in and kept them there. It was the disconnection. It's being disconnected. And so being that I have, uh, have learned this, as long as I'm connected through meditation, through, you know, talking with my sponsor, through working with the sponsee, through reaching out for help, through the podcast, through going out and doing my public speaking, you know, these types of things, uh, through attending church, you know, so that's kind of a 12 step meeting in, in, in my book. It's, uh, it's me going it's in community. Connection. It's connection. Exactly. That's community. what it is. It's, yeah. So is, yeah. as long as I'm involved in the community and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm willing to share when I'm struggling, you know, something's coming up, man, I need to go, I need to go share that with somebody. It's when I push that, when I push that stuff down and say, Oh, I, I get this on my own. I don't need to tell anybody about that. That's when okay. I get, you know, so if I take, if I take a quick inventory, then I still have a sponsor, correct? You still have a sponsor, right? Yes. Uh, you're going to church regularly. Okay. So there's that spiritual connection plus there's community. All right. You're going out and you're just starting this podcast, right? The high sobriety podcast, correct? Mm -hmm. Which yes. is all about sobriety. Yes. Okay. So there is, there are these elements you're speaking out in public about what happened to you, right? Your battle with addiction, correct? Yeah. Connecting with an audience and connecting you with know, an audience. People. Okay. Yeah. So there is, there is all these levels of accountability, of community, of connection. And I remember that TED talk too, because it's very controversial among the, the recovery community about the, the disease, addiction is the disease of disconnection, right? And uh, I forget the name of the guy that, that, that did the, the TED uh, talk. Well, Johan, Johan Hari does, yeah. he does, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, so yeah. I remember that. And uh, it did, it was very controversial because number one, he's not an addict. Right. And then, and then the rats. <laughs> yeah. Right. And there is, there's no question about it. Right. If we think about the people that succeed in the program and the people that don't succeed, there's one uh, very clear uh, uh, definable trait that the ones that succeed and are, we've got a less than 20% success rate. Right. So, so, you know, that, that in and of itself says something about, you know, 12 step recovery, right? You got an 80, you got an 80% chance of failure. And that I think I'm being conservative. So if you've got, you've got these people that all succeeded, the one thing they have in common is they developed a relationship with a higher power. Boom. That's it. And that's that the it. biggest one. That that's was the, the biggest one. That's the biggest one. And the ones that I've noticed that are constantly talking about, man, I just can't, I just can't get behind this whole idea of like this, this turning it over thing. Like, I don't know. And then this God thing all wrapped up in this whole stigma again because what we're talking about is stigma and there's a stigma behind religion just like there's stigma behind uh 12 step recovery there's there's these stigmas that we all have to deal with and mm -hmm. and until we are able to stand on our own two feet and, and and this is again this is why i asked the question about like how are you maintaining your recovery today because some people are so strict about how they stay clean and sober all right but if 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 i'm listening and i'm one of these 80 percent of the people that go nah, i'm not doing that i'm just not doing that how are we being inclusive in this right so it should be a lot more focusing on the idea that alone we can't do this mm -hmm. right and i think i think most people can get behind the idea that i'm not going to walk out onto a football field by myself and beat a team right of of you know a, a complete football a, a complete offense mm -hmm. right so so i have to i have to embrace the idea that i need to be part of a team and that team we need to be moving in the same direction i can't be part of i can't be on a baseball team walking onto a football field either mm -hmm. right so yeah. we all have to be on the same page and i think with, with with that mindset of you know being able to clearly express to other people hey listen this might not work for you right but I can tell you this, right? If you don't know where else to turn, here are some simple things that I did in my life, right? That can help you, you know? And I, and I think that that is the most important message 
right? The message of, of, inclusive, of, of inclusivity and of wearing recovery like a loose garment, right? Take what you need, leave the rest, check it yeah. out, you know, and, 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 and try not to create that stay, you know, there's one thing we've got to deal with the, the, the stigma behind addiction. Next thing we have to do is we have to deal with the stigma behind recovery. Like we're, we're, we're like, we're fighting two battles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I feel you, man. Right. There's, 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 there's no anonymity there. So anyway, we could go in all kinds of tangents, but we're already an hour and 15 in. So what I'm going to do is, um, unless you have anything else you wanted to say. No, I'm good, good? man. All right. So let's start closing up. And the way I like to close up is for the newcomer. So I'm gonna ask you five questions about your early recovery. And I want you to respond with inspiring answers you can share with our newcomers. Are you ready? Nice. Yes. Okay, so number one, what was keeping you from getting clean or staying clean when you first got introduced to recovery? Man, that ego, that, 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 that's for other people. It's not mm. for me. Well, I would say stigma and ego. Stigma was, man, that's for the people under the bridge or that's for the people like my mm -hmm. you know, crazy relative uh, that can't get, it, can't get themselves together. They're just making bad mistakes. It just keeps making bad mistakes. Um, and, and ego, man, I, yeah. I got this right. edging God out. I, I, I always love that one. Uh, the ego is not my amigo. All mm -hmm. right. So number two, at what point did you have a spiritual awakening that aha moment in recovery where you accepted that you were powerless over drugs and alcohol, but for the first time had developed the hope that you could recover? Man, I didn't even cover this in my story, but uh, it would have to be when I was living in a trailer. <laughs> How could you not cover this? I forgot. In this story? I, forgot. <laughs> I guess I forgot. that's something. If I'm going to forget something, I'm going to forget living in a trailer. Man, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> no, I did, I did skim over that. I mean, I talk about that all, all the time. I don't know how I missed it on, on this one. But we came back to it, and that's the most important part, is uh, I'd gotten out of the third uh, rehab at Cumberland Heights. And my wife's like, not, you're not living here. Not living here in the nice, nice house anymore. Uh -uh. And so <clears> – <throat> Uh, I could have gone to a high end, nice, you know, sober living home where people who with, with names around the Nashville area tend to go to. And that was the first one on my list. And I made a phone call and I set up a, an appointment for the guy to come see me at the treatment center to go talk about staying there. And I slept on it for a few nights and something was just pulling at me saying, don't go there, man. Don't go there. Go to the other place. So I called that guy. I said, man, I can't go to that one. And so I go to, uh, uh, less than desirable one and it had multiple buildings on this property and i got put into the, the trailer it was a double wide trailer and to go from the playboy mansion to a double wide trailer with uh, mold and i mean the holes in the floor i could see I, in the kitchen i could see the floor through the holes in the floor um it was just filthy and my roommate had medical issues with ooze coming out of his leg he had pain pills there i mean this was not a good environment for me to be in but I'm sitting on this bed and I'm sitting on the, on the bed in this place. And I had nothing. I, I had my blankets and I had, it's weird, essential oils, I had essential oils. <laughs> and I use those. I use, that's like what I had. And that was a way for me to be able to connect with a, with a, well, I believe God put the oils on the earth for us to be able to use as medicine. And so I use that as, as, as fuel to just Lord, please, bathe me and, and, and wash this stuff out of me because I can't do this on my own. And, and so I, I cleaned out the bathtub there. I mean, it was just filthy bad. Nobody had ever used it probably in you know years. I get down there, I'm on my hands and knees scrubbing that so that I can bathe in the oils. And I still bathe in my bathroom in these oils four to five times a week. That's a part of my, part of my recovery program as well. And, uh, and praying over them before I, I get into the bath to let God, you know, um, use those to heal, to, to continue to, to, um, to, to work through me. And so really being in that trailer and, and not having any of the, the luxuries of, of being able to see my children and my wife and, and having a job or, or any kind of normal life was, uh, was a wake-up call for me. And that, that's when, uh, that's what I would say was, was kind of my aha moment was this, is, this could be my life if I don't get my shit together. The rock bottom moment, right? Like the, the, the reality yes. strikes, you know? Yes. And you know, the, the reason why your wife is still with you, right, is because, I mean, she, she obviously is very strong, very intuitive, and does not put up with any garbage. 
Right. So, 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 you know, she knows when it's time to take the pants off John and put them on herself. Right. Mm -hmm. And John knows when to listen. And that's part of being in a very beautiful, very cohesive marriage, right? When you know that you've got someone that's constantly got your back and when it's time to switch roles, you know, you, you can, you know, Mm -hmm. I, I mean, my wife's put me in my place plenty of times. And if I would have allowed my ego, right. To, 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 to get in the way, I could have ruined my marriage. I could have lost my marriage. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? But it's just that, and the recovery, man, you know, I mean, you have, you had plenty of recovery at this point. Yeah. Right? You understood the idea and the concept of humility. And sometimes it just clicks, man. You're like, even though you're fighting everything in, in your, every bone in your body that is connected to your ego, right? There's a yes. little voice that says, no, no, no. No, no, no. You, you, your best thinking got you here. All right, shut it down and do what you're told, right? And yeah, I think yeah. that's, a, that's, a beautiful, that's a beautiful aha moment. And just be like, man, I'm willing to do what other people tell me to yeah. do. You know, I can't, yeah, totally. willing to do what you tell me. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. All right, so what is the best way for people to reach out to you, to connect with you? Like, you know, what have you got out there? What's your social media? You know, what, 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 is, what is it that you're promoting right now? If anything, that you would want people to connect with you with? So yeah, biggest thing would be, um, uh, high sobriety podcast. I've had uh, folks thank you, thank you again for this opportunity. Um, I've had on, on mine. We've had several members of the band Corn. We've had um, guy from Three Doors Down, Todd Harrell from Three Doors Down. He killed a guy here in Nashville uh, driving under the influence. Really? Killed, yeah, yeah. He was a bassist for Three Doors Down in their heyday in the '90s and 2000s. Love Three Doors and, Down. Uh, he was he was a uh, great guy. It could have happened to me. It could happen to anybody. Right? Yeah, of course. He's paid his dues. He's done his jail time. He's on the mend. Uh, so we've had him on. We, I've had Johan Hari, the author of uh, Chasing the Scream. Um, and so anyway, we, we just have a, have, have a fun time. I'm actually getting to interview on Friday, uh, General uh, Barry McCaffrey, who is one of the most decorated Army four-star generals in American history. Uh, he was the first drug czar appointed. Uh, he was appointed back by uh, President Clinton. And so I'll be talking with him on Friday on my podcast. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And then um, Addiction Campuses, and that's through Addiction Campuses. So if you need, know somebody that needs help, um, we take 13,000 calls a month into our call center. Um, we can help steer you in the right direction there. And then personally and professionally, uh, John Clint Mabry. So going back to the beginning of our conversation, uh, <laughs> Clint is my middle name. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, John, J-O-H-N. Clint, C-L-I-N-T, Mabry, M-A-B-R-Y, um, on all social media platforms. And, um, oh, the one thing I'm, I'm really excited about that's kind of happening behind the scenes and not Bring a lot of people know about is, so the drummer for Corn lives, in, it lives down the street here. Mm-hmm. And so I friended, uh, he and his wife, his name's Ray Luzier, and the nicest guy. I've, I've had him on the podcast, and he actually doesn't drink or do drugs, never has. Um, well, he drinks a little bit, but he's, he's not into the drug drugs. He's actually been fired by numerous, numerous bands for not doing drugs. Um, Dude. but, uh, but everyone on corn is sober now. Everybody's, everybody's sober. Uh, he's the only one that does anything. He drinks just a little bit. So he's kind of the oddball. Uh, but he and his wife have, uh, his wife is the daughter of an addict and she has been through so much pain being raised for, as a father, uh, who, who's a, an addict that she is finally stepping out. And because and I'm not taking credit for this. It's God. But because I'm willing to share my story um, and not be anonymous, because I'm willing to share it publicly, she kind of latched onto it. And we work out at the same boxing gym. She saw that. And one day she came up to me in tears, crying, going, look, I think my dad, he's, he's relapsed and he, uh, he's on heroin again. I feel like he may die any day now. And we wanted to start a nonprofit years ago. And now that he's relapsed, I think I may just need to do it on my own. What do you think? And I'm like, absolutely. You got to go for it. So it's called Rebel for a Change. And uh, we're doing a lot of, she's doing a lot of work behind the scenes right now. All there is is a landing page online right now, but uh, they have a song. She's got a theme song for it. That's already been written and cut. Ray does the drums on it. Uh, We are doing a um, mission statement video with this high powered, unbelievable videographer. That's going to make this thing amazing. And we're going to be raising millions of dollars in the years to come to support families struggling with addiction. A lot of times there's, there's resources for the addict themselves, but the, like I said, the, the family members, the ripple effect, 
144 people die a day of this disease in America. The family members and the, the uh, support system around them, the people, friends at church and their employers, all those people are affected by each of those deaths. So there's this huge clump of, of people that, that, that needs extra support. And so um, we're going to be raising millions of dollars in the years to come through Rebel for a Change. If you want to donate today, you can go online and do that, rebelforachange.com. I'm going to have all this listed on the show notes, guys. So you can just go straight to the Share Podcast, all the social media, uh, the Rebel for Change. Rebel for Change, right? Rebel for a, a Change. Rebel yeah. for a Change. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go in there and you can send this all to me too, man. Cool. Uh, that'll make it easier for me. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so High Sobriety Podcast. When are you going to have one of the most famous uh, recovery podcast hosts on the internet, Omar Pinto, the Share Podcast, Man, on your show. We need to sign you up. <laughs> we'll get you signed up. All right, today. dude. I, I was feeling a little like, wow, a little left no, eye. You're on it. No, you're on it, man. <laughs> this is awesome. I love it. Absolutely. Okay, good. All right, so next on the agenda. All right, so then two more questions, and we are rolling out. All right, so number four, what is the best suggestion you have ever received? Get over yourself. <laughs> get over yourself. I mean, simple. It's get over yourself. Um, that, yeah. Let's that encompasses that. That that that. Trust me. That, that, mean, and that, that, that means volumes, get man. in touch with God. That yeah. means getting you know getting in touch with the higher power. That was you know. Rule sixty two. Don't take yourself yeah. so damn seriously. That's an A. Yep. Yep. All and right. hey, hey, here's. Go ahead. Can I tell one story? I think it's good for, for listeners yeah, real quick. Bring it. So I'm, so I'm in Stillwaters and this guy goes, Tommy, this guy, Tommy. Oh my gosh. I mean, he, God bless his soul. He helped me. But I looked at him. He's like this NASCAR guy. I mean, you know, like backwoods, Tennessee NASCAR guy. And I'm, of course I'm judging him because he's different than me and I'm better than him. And he sits there and he goes, he's, he's sitting in the group and he goes, man, my God, carries around a wallet with a chain in it that says bad motherfucker and i'm like what <laughs> your god can't do that i was raised by you know billy graham's friend my grandfather pastor who baptized me when i was 10 years old <laughs> you can't have that view of god and that was a huge wake-up call for me to realize who am i to judge somebody else's view of god that's what works for him that works for him you know and so again just get over yourself. It goes oh. back to get over yourself, man. If, if that works for him, good for him. And now my concept of the God, he opened my mind to a whole new concept for God that now that, I, that I'm able to apply. And it's always moving and changing for me. But it, it really opened my mind to like, man, quit, quit, quit taking yourself so seriously and think outside the box a little bit. So There's no question about it. There's no question about it, right? It, it's that that was what got me in, right? Listen to somebody's description of God that sounds like that. Right. Because yeah, like, in all reality, God's a bad motherfucker. You know what I mean? And if you can get over the rhetoric again, just get get past the dialogue and connect with the emotion. That's it. Get past the rhetoric, get past the dialogue, connect with this, what this guy's message is. Right. Connect with inclusivity. Right. I think it's I think it's a beautiful, perfect message. Um, OK, so number five, if you could give our newcomers only one suggestion, what would that be? Keep coming back. Don't give up, man. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Every time you go and do something, and even if you go backwards, it's okay. You still, you're, I still built on those failures. I still built on those failures. And so just keep coming back and don't give up, man. Yeah. Successful people aren't successful because they didn't fail. Right? Exactly. They're successful because they failed. Right? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then do a little due diligence. But <laughs> failure is a requirement for success, period. All right, we have now reached the end of our show. John, thank you so much for joining us, man. This has been awesome. Oh, you're, this, is, this is the best, man. It's the best interview. Thank you so much. Oh, I love it. Thank you. All right, folks, we've now reached the end of our show. Thanks for joining us. And as we say here in Costa Rica, pura vida. Can you give us a pura vida, John? Pura vida. <laughs>